All right, let me pray, and then we're going to hop into our series on relationships. So let me pray first. God, we ask right now that your spirit would minister to us, Lord, that you would take your word and help us to hear you clearly, and that you would um, help us, Lord, to become the kind of people that you need us to be. Help us to be peaceful people uh, who, who navigate relationships well in the power of the gospel. And we pray this, please, in your name. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk this morning about being a person of peace. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, we're told that God has called us to live in peace. Um, there's a letter from a senior minister to a younger minister, and he tells them this in Titus 3, verses 1 and 2, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate and always gentle toward everyone. In other words, uh, Paul is writing to Titus saying, here's what we need to teach the people to be. Peaceable people, considerate people, people who are gentle, people who in their relationships, they display the gospel. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at this way of peace. And there are some Bibles scattered around here. And if you get with me to Colossians chapter 3, we're going to look at how to grow in being a peaceful person. It should be on page 955, but we're going to, we're going to get there and, uh, and get into that text in just a minute. Um, now, what we've noticed as we kind of went through this series is that the way that we talk really reveals the condition of our heart. Proverbs clues us in on this. In fact, it says in Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And so how we communicate in the midst of our relationships really reveals the condition of our heart. And uh, I was doing premarital counseling a couple years ago, and um, this couple, uh, they, they were going to have their, their ceremony at their home, and so they were getting the yard ready, and they were getting the, the house ready. They're going to have a bunch of guests and people around. And um, the, the gentleman, he, had a, he was building furniture in the basement. And um, the bride was, uh, invited all these people over to help in the yard. And so he was down in the basement finishing up this, um, this bar, and then he was going to put the, the clear coat finish on it. And so that's what he was working on. And all these people show up, and so she's ready to get going on the yard work, and he's down in the basement and, um, and putting this clear coat on. And she's like, well, he's not coming up, so let's work on something else. So we've got some boxes that need to go down in the basement to kind of let him know, hey, we're here, we're ready, let's get working on this. And so they start marching all of these boxes down, and... He's, he's, he freaks out because all of a sudden all the dust is, you know, there's all this dust and he's putting the clear coat on and all words start coming out of his mouth and out of her mouth. And they got together with me and they're like, we almost called off the wedding. And I was like, man, this is crazy. But you recognize, we recognize that in relationships that things can escalate very quickly in the way that we communicate. Um, it has the ability to either cool the scenario down or to stir up anger. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And so what we want to do is we want to learn how to become people of peace so that even when the conflict episode is happening, we have the ability to, in the power of the gospel, graciously interact with other people. Uh, that's what we're after this morning. And so if you're in Colossians chapter 3 now, um, I, there's several different things here, and we're just going to work our way through it, but we're going to start in verse 5 of Colossians chapter 3. And so the first thing, so if we're, here's what we're trying to do this morning. We're trying to figure out how could we grow in our ability to be peaceful people. So number one, we have to put sin to death. Um, verse 5 puts it like this, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Put sin to death. There's an old Puritan, John Owen, and he wrote this, in, this book uh, called The Mortification of Sin. Kill sin. This is what he says in that book. Do you mortify? And that just means that you're putting to death sin. Do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it while you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will kill you. We have an obligation to kill sin, that we need to put it to death. And so whenever... That, that tendency in us to get angry or bitter or, or, or upset, we have an opportunity then to wrestle that to the cross and allow for the forgiveness and grace to, to overwhelm that sin. But that's part of what we need to do. We need to put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature. 
We need to put to death. And so that's, that's a major assignment in the, in the Christian life, that we would figure out how to take sin and wrestle it to the cross to kill it there. We do not want to manage sin. We don't want to try to minimize it and say, you know what, I just want to figure out how to get this, you know, at a lower level in my life. No, we take sin and we kill it. And that's what we do as believers. So we need to put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature. Here's the second thing that we need to do if we're going to grow and being peaceful people. We need to call sin, sin. Um, here's what's interesting. If you keep going in verse 5, it, it gives us this, this list. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. So it starts out the head of the list. It's got all of these extravagant sins, and it reminds us that the wrath of God is coming on account of this kind of sin. And so he's willing to kind of say, this is what it is. But then notice, notice what he says in verse 7. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid, rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips, and do not lie to each other. In other words, there's all these relational sins as well. Um, we've got those extravagant ones on the front end that we know, sexual immorality, uh, lust, evil desires, and greed, idolatry, those are inappropriate for a believer. I mean, we don't have to be told that. We just know it intuitively. We should not engage in those sorts of things. Uh, I can think about how devastating it would be if I were to engage in sexual immorality, what it would do to my family, what it would do to my ministry. I know that's totally inappropriate, but here's what Paul does. He also says, not only those things, the extravagant sins that we're, that we're very quick to point out and say, no, we shouldn't do that, but also relational sins. This anger, um, this rage, this malice, slander, and filthy language, those sorts of things as well are also sin. And I think a lot of times Christians are willing to kind of highlight the more extravagant sins, but then there's other ones that we kind of minimize and we try to manage. And Paul is saying here that we need to call sin what it is. It is, it, it is also a sin when I get, come home from work and I speak to my wife in a way that's full of these sorts of relational sins, okay? Uh, that's what we need to see. That, that sin is sin, and we need to be willing to, to call it out and recognize this is something that, that needs to be dealt with, that needs to be mortified, that needs to be put to death, that needs to be brought to the cross. So sin is sin. It is the former way of life. It is the way that we once lived, and we have an obligation now to live in this newness of life. So number one, we need to put sin to death. Number two, we need to call sin what it is. Then number three, we get to put off and put on. There's this principle of taking things off and then putting things on. And we see that there in verses 9 and 10. Uh, it says, do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and you have put on the new self, which is being re renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. So we are, we, we engage in this process, the Christians engage in this process of taking off these elements of the former way of life. And then we have an obligation to also put on what is appropriate for the children of God. And so in our mind, we should be thinking through, okay, well, what does this look like? Well, we need to, um, whenever we recognize that we're engaging in relational sin, that we should be thinking, I have to take this off and, and I have to um, be willing to put on what God wants for me. This is the, the gospel process of becoming more like Christ, that we are looking at the sin items in our lives and we're saying that this is no longer appropriate. I'm a new creation. I'm taking this off. This was an old way of life. This is a former way of life. And then I'm going to replace that with the power of, of what Christ wants me to do in the midst of our relationships. Um, and so there's this principle of putting off and, and putting on. A few weeks ago, um, we were going to a, a funeral service in, uh, in Chicago, and so I'm getting ready for, uh, you know, to head in with, with Ash and the kids, and I get myself dressed, and um, Ash looks at me, and she's like, you going to wear that? I was like, uh, yeah, I'm going to wear this. And she's like, well, I don't know if that's really the appropriate attire for this. You kind of look like a hipster farmer. And... <laughs> like, sweet, I like that. I grew up on a farm. Um, 
but she, she says, you should probably wear this. And she kind of sets out the stuff that, that she felt like would be appropriate. And so what do I do? I, I'm like, oh, I get so, I'm so frustrated by this scenario. And I reluctantly put it on. And, um, and I, it, there was a moment where I was in the closet putting this stuff on. And I'm like, oh, this stuff is so uncomfortable. And I like kick my, my laundry basket, which is wicker. And so it, it like explodes. And I'm like, that is so unimpressive. But here's what's happening. There's this, this old way of life that's coming out of me, this former way of life, this, this anger, this, this, this rage, this, it's low-level stuff that's coming to the surface. And, and it's a relational sin. It's what we see here in this text is this idea that, okay, yes, I'm not going to engage in sexual immorality, but, but when this sort of sin comes out, I need to be able to say, this is what it is. It is sin, that there's something in my heart that is not right. And I have an obligation to put this off and to replace it with this different, different way of life. And, and um, so we have this idea here of putting off the former way of life, putting on what is appropriate, that's being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. What's incredible for Christians is that we are being constantly transformed into the image of Christ. That God uses these opportunities in our relationship to make us more like his son. And when we participate by faith in what he's doing, it becomes this, this thing that, that helps us to grow, where, where the sin nature is being revealed in us, but then we're taking it to the cross and we're finding forgiveness and grace. We're putting those things off and we're putting on what Christ would have us to do in, in that scenario. Then the next thing that, it, that we see here is that we do not let our differences divide. Um, it, it puts it like this. It says um, in verse 11. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. We do not allow our differences to divide. Now, in this list, obviously, there are significant differences. There are different categories of people, different ways that you might think about people. And this is reminding us that in Christ, we do not let the differences become a point of division. Because if we're believers, then we share the most fundamental and important thing together, that we are in Christ and Christ is in all. And so the differences that, that come out in our relationships, they cannot become an opportunity for us to engage in conflict and, and to participate in sin. If we're in Christ, then, then our relationship that, the relationships that are forged in Christ, we have to be willing to let secondary matters kind of be secondary matters. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Our differences cannot be, an, be something that would cause us to divide. Um, so I was thinking about another example of this, and, and uh, the one that I often bring up in premarital counseling is the difference between Ash and I. Um, there's, there's so many significant ones, but one of them is just the way that we were raised. She grew up with two sisters and no brothers. I grew up with three brothers and no sisters. So the, we're, we're very different in that regard. Our experiences were very different. And I remember the first year that we were married, um, it, was, it was the Christmas season, and so we were getting everything, getting the house all decorated and, and uh, just getting ready for participating in the Christmas season. And, and Ash had this tradition in her family where they would make cookies and they would decorate the house all while listening to boy band Christmas, Christmas music. I grew up on a Christmas tree farm. And so my experience of the Christmas season was we're working, we're doing everything that's necessary to make a living in the short amount of time. And so Ash and I, um, first Christmas, it was conflict. And she's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, what's wrong with you? We don't listen to in, in sync Christmas music and dance around and get everything ready. So, so there, were the, there was a significant difference. But here's what this is saying, that differences cannot be an opportunity for us to divide. That in Christ... We are united. Christ is the, the foundational element in our relationship. Um, Christ is all and is in all, so we don't let our differences divide. Here's the fifth thing that we're told to do. We need to dress our part. Look at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. What we need to be doing is, is we need to be dressing the part. That if we are this new people, 
then we need to exhibit the fruit of the character of God. As God's chosen people, we, we belong to God. If we're in Christ, we, we are his. We're, his. we're his treasured possession. We are holy and dearly loved by God the Father. And so what we need to do then is we need to put on these characteristics that would be fitting for us as the children of God, as the people of God. We need to be clothing ourselves with compassion. That in our relationships that we're looking for opportunities to show compassion to others. That we should be clothed with kindness. That we should be looking for opportunities to be a blessing and to be kind and thoughtful and caring to those around us. That we should be marked with humility. That we should be full of gentleness in our relationships. I mean, when you evaluate the, the condition of your relationships, do these things come out? Would you be able to say, this is what's going on because I'm in Christ and God is renewing me in the image of my creator that I am putting on all of these different elements that I'm full of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. If not, then this is the agenda that we have before us this morning. Put these things on. Put on these characteristics of Christ himself. And obviously, it's not something that we just kind of muscle up and go, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be better. I'm going to be awesome. It's, it's, what this should, should do is it should cause us to be very dependent on God, that we should be praying, God, this is, a, this is a supernatural thing, and I need your spirit in me to fill me with these sorts of things. And so we need to dress our part. We need to be putting on the characteristics of Christ himself, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then we're told uh, the next strategy to grow in being people of peace is that we need to put up with one another. Look at verse 13. Bear with each other. Bear with each other. In other words, be patient in the midst of your relationships. We're all a work in progress. And, and what we have a tendency to do is to look at other people and say, you ought to. You should be a lot further along. You, you ought to be doing things in this sort of way. But, but we're reminded of the long game that God has here. That he is slowly and patiently recreating us in the image of his son. And so the relationships that we have give us an opportunity to trust God with that long game. That the relationships that we have, we can't be thinking, why aren't you further along than this? Why don't you understand how we ought to be in relationship with one another? No, what we're told here is that we need to put up with one another. We need to bear with each other and recognize that our relationships are a gift. And that if we can be patient in the midst of our relationships, then we're growing in God, godliness. And so uh, the sixth thing that we need is to be patient. The seventh thing that we need to do is to forgive. Look at the second half of verse 13. Forgive one another... If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Uh, so, so what we get to do then is in, in our relationships and in the midst of conflict, we have the opportunity to display what God has done for us. As forgiven people, we get to extend forgiveness to others. That if there's a grievance, if there's a problem, if there's something that's going on, we as Christians ought to be the kind of people who can offer and extend forgiveness to others very quickly. Not in a superficial way to get past the conflict, but in a genuine and sincere way, recognizing that we were enemies of God. And while we were enemies, he pursued us in love and reconciled us to himself. We're forgiven people. So in our relationships, when there are grievances, we should be the ones who are, who are pursuing forgiveness as part of the agenda. And so that's the seventh thing there, that we need to be people who can forgive well. The eighth thing is that we should love verse 14, and over all these virtues that he just laid out for us, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is the, the essential element of, of the believer. Love is the thing that we need to put on over all of these other virtues. It binds them all together in perfect unity. So love is, is, is really what we're after here. Love needs to mark our relationships. Love is something that we need to pursue. And then verse 15, we're reminded that this is all about peace. Let peace rule. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. So let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. This is our high calling to be peaceful people. And, and this reminds us that this whole thing, that this whole section of scripture that we've been looking at is really an, an extended application of the gospel. 
what we need to do is learn to have our hearts so radically transformed by what God has done for us that we have experienced that, that God loved us enough to send his son Jesus to die in our place, that we've been reconciled to God the Father through faith in his son, and that we can experience peace then, the peace of Christ, that our relationships um, then can reflect that as well. So because we have the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts, then we can extend peace in the midst of the relationships that we're in, and we are called to this. I mean, Christians are called to this certain way of life. We've been saying this over the last several weeks, that, that we, want for, we, we want the characteristic, the culture of this congregation to be one where it is relationally beautiful. We want our congregation here at the McChesney Park campus to reflect the culture of the gospel. So I don't care if we get a lot of other things wrong. But if you come in here and you recognize that this is a place where relationships are beautiful because it's a bunch of people who have been changed by the gospel and that shows up in the way that we relate to one another, that's our goal. That's our agenda. We want that here. And so we're praying for that, that we would be people who the peace of Christ is ruling in our hearts and it is then overflowing in the midst of everything that we're doing together. We want to be a part of a gospel culture. Um, and, and I hope that you will join me in that. So um, we, we've seen here in Colossians chapter 3 that there is a way for us to grow in peace. There is some work to do. There are certain things that we need to be engaged in. We need to put our sin to death. We need to be willing to wrestle sin to the cross. We need to call sin what it is. The relational sin is not something that we can kind of manage. It's something that we need to also be willing to kill. We need to be willing to put off this former way of life and put on what Christ has for us today. We do not allow our differences to divide. Um, we want to dress in the compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience of Christ himself. We want to be willing to be patient in the midst of our relationships, bearing with one another. We want to forgive as we have been forgiven and we want to love well, all while letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. So let's pray. And then we're going to worship uh, once more. So let's pray now. God, we ask that you would help us as a congregation to become people of peace. Lord, we pray that you would radically transform us by your gospel. We ask, Lord, that you would um, overwhelm our hearts with the peace of Christ so that our relationships could reflect the beauty of the gospel. And we ask this, please, in your name. Amen. <coughs>